Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I'm so pleased to talk to my friend, Caraway Carter. Caraway has worn numerous hats during his life. He's been a furniture salesman, a dresser, a costumer, an actor, a rabble rouser, a poet, and he's currently a writer of relationship fiction that reminds his readers it's never too late for love. And he lives that tagline since he married his husband on Halloween at the age of 49. Talking with Caraway is always a wild ride, and I am thrilled I finally got him on the show to talk about why Tales of the City by Armistead Mopan is the best book ever. If you're looking for a way to help support this podcast that is free and takes up very little of your time, why not leave a review on whatever podcatcher you use? Through some sort of magical algorithm system that I don't fully understand, if a podcast has reviews, it's suggested to new listeners more often. So do it right now. Just scroll down on your phone and hit the leave a review button. It'll take just a few seconds of your time and it really helps me out. I'm super grateful for your support. Now, back to the show. Hi, Caraway. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, thank you. It's good to be here. It has seemed to me through the pandemic that you have really maintained a level of creative production that most people are not managing. What is what is inspiring you to, to remain so creative lately? I wasn't creative for, I would say, until about May. I was not, I mean, I was, uh, we watched every MCU movie and we watched uh, the entirety of Battlestar, Gal- no, not Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, no, Babylon 5. We watched all, <laughs> all of Babylon 5 and some days we would just go out at noon and watch like seven episodes in a day because what else were you going to do? I mean, you couldn't go anywhere, right? So then we watched all of that. We watched the Machete Order of Star Wars Universe. I don't know. I know it's oh, weird. I never. Heard I don't know. That. It's a very weird order, but it worked really, really well. Okay. So we watched all of those, and then, um, and then we started watching home shows and baking shows, um, the Great British Baking Show, and then we watched all of Not, uh, Nadia's show, the first show, and then we watched all of Hometown, and then, yeah. So we started just watching a ton of TV, and we just were just watching TV. And then I got sick. And then um, Alexis Rourke um, said, you should write a short story for this anthology. And I said, "Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not really writing anything. And she goes, well, I think you should really write this. And I thought, well, it's probably, they're not going to pick it because it's a gay story. And it was called Prince of Hearts. Um, And it was, and it, it fits into my uh, Professions of Love series. Do you think it's all that input? I'm using Rebecca, um, Becca Syme language here, but do you think it's all that input you had at the beginning of the pandemic? What do you think has been causing you to be so creative and productive where so many people are absolutely just stopped in their work lately? What I realize is the... Um, my adaptability. So I'm not working anymore. I'm focusing on my writing. Um, It lets me escape. It lets me um, finally do what I never had the chance to do because I would work for eight hours a day. Then I'd spend, I was actually out of the house like 10 to 12 hours a day because driving to work, working, driving home from work, traffic both ends. And then, um, and then I'd get home, I'd have to, we'd go out to dinner and then I'd have no time to write. And then I'd go to bed and then do it all over again. So I only had Fridays and Saturdays to write really. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I got furloughed, I ha- I decided to, I wrote something the next day. Well, I've been furloughed, so I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to watch a lot of TV. Then I started noticing things and then I just slowly progressed and it picked up and I just found myself writing something every single day. Once it just started rolling, it's like every day I would wake up and say, oh, I have to write something. And they varied. Sometimes they were super political. Sometimes they were super um, stressed out. And so I actually have had tons of people say, 
oh my God, I look forward to reading your shelter in place every day. I, I my day is incomplete if I don't read your shelter in place. Um, and that has encouraged me to continue writing it too. Mm -hmm. So I think that once I found out that my short story got accepted into the anthology, I had, it's like, I got a, a kick in the ass and I said, okay, they, they like this story. Hearing back from other people made me just more excited about writing more stuff. And so it just, it just snowballed and ideas just kept coming into my head and I, I write them down now and um, tell me about your reading life. What is it like and has it changed in pandemic times? It has. I actually, I got on a huge Cressley Cole kick. Did you ever listen to those or read no, those? No, are they good? Okay, listening to them. The guy's accent for the majority of them is um, he's got like a Scottish brogue and his voice is like, butter it's like mm -hmm. so sexy and so like yeah I listened to um like 15 of them I was following um uh Faded Mates podcast and so I would read it I'd listen to it and then they would talk about it the next week and then we would then they would discuss and so I went through that with them so then I started listening to uh Jess Michaels who has good books lately I've been reading a ton of uh, craft books when you read craft books, do you also listen to those on audio or do you? I you did. Mm. One that really helped me a lot was 2K, 2 to, 2K to 10K. So I was reading it and I was listening to it. Mm. Uh, the book that we're talking about, I read it 30 years ago. So I got the audio so I could listen to the audio of it. And so I was reading and listening along. How did you get to, how did you originally find this book that we're talking about today, Tales of the City? So there was a gay bookstore in West Hollywood in the, I want to say the early eighties. Um, and it was like the first gay bookstore I'd been in. Um, I, it was like the first gay book I picked up that I really fell in love with. And I read them. I swear I, every week I would go out and get the next copy, the next copy, the next copy. I remember just running through them, reading them. I, I worked at the um, the Beverly Center mm -hmm. in uh, West Hollywood at that time. And so I was taking the bus in from Covina because I lived in Covina, California. I didn't have a car. And I had gotten a job at the Beverly Center because I wanted to be gay and out and do all those things. And so I, um, I went there and I got the book and I would read it on the bus to and from work. And um, yeah, that's how I read through it. Um, I just loved it. I wanted the, I wanted that lifestyle and I never was that kind of person. I was, I think there was a, a scene in the book where that's towards the end where um, uh, Michael says something about he's got a fat ass and uh, oh, he's not gay. And um Brian says, oh, he has to be gay. And he goes, no, he's got a fat ass. Uh, gays with fat asses don't go out. And that's was me. Is just, I was a fat guy who just didn't feel acceptable because in the 80s, it was all about size. And I was, I've always been a large guy. Um, I did go through a period where I lost 100 pounds and I was super thin. I had more sex when I was fat. So <laughs> I didn't stay thin very long. So... <laughs> Anyways, I doesn't sound like a good payoff then. <laughs> I, yeah, it was. I was. It was great. I felt good. I looked good, but I, I didn't have. I was actually. My friend said you're an asshole. So oh. I went yeah, because you were hungry that. all the time. <laughs> I know. I know. So. so was the appeal of it on your first read through? Was it? Was it that you had not seen? that idealized lifestyle in print before, or was it, did you really feel like it was that well-written? I think what I liked about this is this has a layer of mystery in it and it mm -hmm. has a layer of romance in it. And it has a layer of um, dirtiness and pot and just all this other stuff that is just so unique. Um, and it was like something that I had never read before. It was like, he was talking to me, like I was really involved in these people's lives. And um, when I was doing research on the book, um, I found out that 
the book, the first book, Tales of the City, was actually a series of articles, which is why each of the chapters are so small, because it was a serial that was released in, um, it was released first in the Marin paper, and then the San Francisco Chronicle picked it up. And then it was just like every week he just posted something. And then he said that, um, that based on, based on what people sent him, he would change stories or he would change the story based around what other people sent. I feel like this book has been around forever and is um, really kind of part of culture, especially since it is also a very popular series. But if you were to describe this book, how would you summarize it for someone who had never read it? Um, I would say it's a slice of life in the seventies. How did you feel about it? Have you reread it at all since the first time you read it 30 years ago and then now you, I did. I uh, I read it to my husband, um, who is not up on pop culture and is younger than me, and is autistic. So um, it took it was hard for him to grasp a lot of it because it's the chapters. It doesn't flow. It's like oh, this character's life, and then this person's life. It's almost yes. like a. Uh, George R. R. Martin, and then each chapter is a different person. But yeah, I mean, I've read it a lot. When I, it's like home. It's like um, picking it up reminds me of uh, that time. Yeah, you know, I just I, I was a little bit disappointed in the mini series that Netflix show that came on because it didn't feel like the first book to me. Does that make sense? Well, I haven't seen. I was going to ask you that, and I haven't seen the series. Um, it just felt very, very familiar. There was something very California 70s hippie that was just very, very familiar to me. And so I was curious if they were able to capture that in the series. I didn't really get into it. I think I watched one or two episodes and was just like, this doesn't feel like it for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like Marianne in that one as much as I liked her in the other ones. And it was really, I didn't remember her being such a horrible person. Do you like her in the book? Though? I love must. her in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I love Marianne because Marianne has that adventure quality that mm-hmm. I always wished I could run away and do. And I've run away. I ran away. I sold everything I owned to move to New York once. And I lasted for like four weeks, three weeks. And um, then I took a, a bus down to Florida where my family in Florida lived. And I said, hey, if I ever was to be in Florida for vacation, do you think I could stop by? And they said, sure. And I said, okay, I'm at the bus station. <laughs> so then stayed in Florida for a few months and realized how horrible that was. And then I came back to California. So I've, um, yeah, my life, I've been a lot of places. Were you always chasing this Marianne experience? Yeah, I think so. I think I always wanted, I I always wanted to find a place where I felt comfortable, Mm. where I felt like I belonged. And actually, I finally, where I live now, I really feel like I belong here. My, um, I live in Bixby Knowles in Long Beach. So is finding your place a function of Bixby Knowles or is it just a function of being the age that you are and finding your partner that you, would it matter where you lived? I think so. I, um, I think place is an important thing. I have lived in places where I didn't feel comfortable. It is a very progressive city. Our mayor's gay. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's um, it's just a very comfortable place to be. It's uh, I just like it. And so it's like a small town, you know? And I love books that can convey that sense of very special, very small sense of belonging in a vast place. And I really thought you'd get that in this book. And then that's when I really realized that um, I write, and my husband said the same thing. I've always written a little like uh, Armistead Maupin Mm -hmm. in that I love writing sagas, like big stories with lots of characters, but I write super sexy. Like on the first page of my first book uh, of Hearts Repaired, a blowjob happens like three paragraphs later. On my thing, I say that my books, my Professions of Love series is like Tales of the City 
meets queer as folk because queer as folk was all about the sex and all of the you know the party stuff and all the weird stuff and tales of the city is about how um it's such a large city and yet everybody knows everybody what i love about tales of the city is how small of a world it really is i mean it is even our lives uh i call my husband my husband Mm-hmm. The husband was reading his old live journal posts to me the other night and saw that I'd commented on a post he wrote five years before we met each other. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's just like, it's like weird how close people can be. When I look at Facebook and I see who people are friends with, I'm like, how's that possible? You know, it's just so weird to me. It's interesting that you market your books. Um, that the tagline is Tales of the City meets Queer as Folk. Because the other thing I was thinking as I was reading Tales of the City, I think I might have read it in college. It sure felt familiar as I was reading. I remember back in college thinking like it was kind of known as a shocking book, right? Oh, well, I could see. A little bit, a little bit. But like reading through it this time, I was going... (laughs) What was the big deal? And I do remember the controversy when when the initial series came out that it was protested a lot because it was so shocking. And oh my God, reading it now, you just think we were uptight back in those days because it was well, it's not a big deal. When I mean, okay, was- the cocaine is bad. I get that. And that child, the guy who was a child porn guy, that's very bad. They were more worried about the homosexuality about it. Yeah. When he was writing it, he had a contract or they had a list of all of the gay characters in the stories and he couldn't have more than so many of them. So yeah, he, I read that in a Wikipedia article where he said, yeah, they had a list where he couldn't go over this number of gay characters, which is why not all of the story is about Michael or not all of the story is about uh, Mona and her thing. But I really loved, I think the thing I really loved about it too was it showed um, so many different levels. It showed lesbianism, it showed gays, it showed gays, it showed bisexual people, it showed, um, you know, that men could be uh, whores, that it's not always, you know, and why are you calling that woman a whore? And it's just, it's, yeah. um, I just got to, I had just finished with a scene where Brian was looking for somebody to go to a party with and, you know, he dated a mother and a daughter. <laughs> That's, he was just having sex with everything. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I remember when the series was coming out and people were protesting because people didn't like gay people. And we have come so far from then. Where mm-hmm. now, I don't think, I think that that's why when they did the new series, they really had to introduce different aspects of stuff because we're open about it now. Mm-hmm. But I could see, yeah, where I was shocked then when I read it, and now I'm not as shocked by anything. It was like when I watched when I watched Bridgerton and I was like, oh my God, yeah. what's he doing to her on the stage? Oh my, you know, and I was like, and then I remember I loved it I think it's a wonderful show and I did I understand that one scene but I know somebody challenged me to write a um a regency novel and um somebody from the plague of players who's British gave me who I should write about so he goes you should write about these people and so sometimes I've been reading some regency stuff do you know um do you know KJ Charles? Have yes. You any? I know people always suggest KJ yeah. Charles to me. I um I follow KJ on uh Twitter and I'm super intrigued. Sometimes I run into well, I don't want to read their stuff because I don't want their stuff to end up in my stuff. Keep KJ Charles on the back burner for once you finish your regency because um I've only read one um band sinister, and it was honestly one of the best books I've ever read. And Oh my god, it was so good. And and I had never heard of her before. And and since then I see her on people's top 10 lists all the time. She is phenomenal. But I totally get that. If you're about to, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. Cause I think it really happens. I think you pick up a style. That's an exercise we used to do um in writing classes when I was in college, where you know, for one hour you were supposed to literally just type look at a book of a book you like and type it word for word and then close that book and then write your own thing and 
then you would have you would write in the style of that author. So it's a definite thing. I mean, I think I write a little like Armistead Maupin. Mm. Um, I think I write a little like John Sanford, um, who writes mysteries. Mm. Uh, I think I write a little like I my my four favorite authors are John Sanford, who writes the Prey novels. Uh, it's a mystery series. Um, Samuel R. Delaney, uh, who writes science fiction. Um, I write a lot of my characters are a lot like Samuel R. Delaney's characters. Um, they're lost people, basically. Um, Armistead Maupin. I love Armistead Maupin. And uh, Laura Antonow. And so I write a little bit like all of their stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, those are pretty much... I have like... Uh, Samuel R. Delaney was huge in the 60s and so I have a lot of paperbacks that I went into used bookstores. So I have like three of the same book, but they all have different covers. And it's just mm. like, I'm a little bit obsessed. He's just a super impressed. And then when I found out that Laura Antonow knows Samuel R. Delaney, that blew me away. Oh, so Samuel R. Delaney, I wrote this, um, this, uh, I don't know if I can talk about it, but I wrote this, um, <laughs> You have wrote, said that so many times during I know. this conversation. That's who I am. I read this <laughs> this uh, Jewish, this secret admirer Hanukkah book called The Eighth Night. And in the book, the um, the main character is reading this book called Dahlgren, which is by Samuel R. Delaney. And um, so... I wanted to, the thing that's super interesting about uh, Dahlgren is that the first sentence of the first chapter is the last sentence of the, is the end of the sentence of the last chapter. So the last line of the last chapter of the book is the beginning of the first. Oh, I love that. Yes. And so um, he says, uh, oh, you're, you're reading Dahlgren. And he goes, yeah, I am. And and the guy goes, oh, I love that book, To Wound the Autumnal City. And then I have the, the, the guy who's reading the book say the last sentence of the, of the book, right? The beginning. And he goes, well, you know, that's the end of the beginning of this. And he goes, I know. That's what's so cool about it. So anyways, that was like 13 words for that whole sentence, right? Mm-hmm. And so I contacted Samuel R. Delaney and I said, I really, really want to put this sentence in this book because I think it'll really connect the two guys. It'll it's their meet cute. And uh, we talked on the phone. He called me and we talked about it and he said, "Yeah, I'm I'm fine with you doing that." So the only people who would really grok it or who would get it are science fiction readers who know who Samuel R. Delaney is. The way it reads, it could just be something I made up. Mm-hmm. But if you read the books, then it's something cool. But no one's ever picked up on it. No one's told me anything about it. And I don't, there's nowhere, nowhere on the advertising of the book does it say anything about Samuel R. Delaney or about Dahlgren. I love stories like that where established authors are super generous. I I love hearing that. I put him in the dedication to Samuel Delaney, whose writing has taken me places I wish um, existed and whose words helped me and my main characters find their connection. Oh, I love it. That makes me so happy. Um, will you tell my listeners all the places where they can find you? Sure. Um, I'm at carawaycarter.com. Um, and everything, um, I, if you want to uh, see me on Facebook, I'm at Facebook, Caraway Carter. Um, Instagram is Instagram slash Caraway Carter. Twitter is Caraway Carter. At Caraway Carter. I got really lucky with the name. Yeah. Uh, you can email me at caraway at carawaycarter.com. I want to thank you for joining me today and for getting me to read this book, which I love so much. And I had so much fun reading. And um, it's been so fun talking to you. I hope you will come back next time, anytime you have a book you want to talk about. I will. Are you, you know, I'm going to make you read a mystery next. <gasps> Yay! I love mysteries. Okay, cool. We'll figure <laughs> something out next year. Thank you, Caraway. Thank you, Julie. You have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com, 
or follow the podcast on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie Wrote a Book. Remember, when you're doing your book shopping, please help support indie bookstores and this podcast by using my affiliate link at bookshop.com slash best book ever. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you at the library. I have ADHD, by the way. <laughs>